A bone-in pork roast is a super delicious way to have a special holiday main dish. This is not a boring pork roast. Instead, it has tons of flavor. I show you the simple ways to make it low and slow so it locks in all of the moisture, all of the flavor, and then roasts at the end for that beautiful crackly skin. You're gonna enjoy it and be surprised how easy this is. So when it comes to the holidays, we think of special occasion meals, special occasion meats sometimes. And so this is a pork roast, but it is a bone-in pork roast, um, also called a rib roast sometimes. And traditionally, a lot of people would do a beef rib roast, sometimes a standing rib roast. Um, they can be pretty pricey, they're delicious, but a pork roast is a great way to have the same type of presentation, something a little bit elevated, super easy, super stress-free, but looks like it took a little bit of extra time. So this is a rib roast, and what I'm doing is Frenching the bones. Now, you can go and get your roast and say you want it bone in. Some people do this to make a crown roast pork. Really, the only reason to do that is just for the look. I don't really think they're worth it. I actually just like to do a standing rib roast like this with pork. And I am fritching the bones because I forgot to have the butcher do it. This is something a lot of times you can just ask your butcher to do. Can you French the bones? What does that mean? It means cleaning the bones so you expose the bone. It's just a traditional thing. Now, let me tell you something. It does nothing to affect the flavor. It does nothing to really affect it other than it makes it a little bit cleaner because you don't have all the fat and all the extra meat around the bone. So when you're roasting, it's easier. It's also easier to eat because you don't have all that to cut around at the table. All that's left is just this little bone here at the top with the whole meat loin underneath. So when you look at this, you have the pork loin right here is the tenderloin pretty much. Then this has all the bone and the rib on it. So that's what we're doing. Now, again, you don't even have to clean these off if you want. This is just for a more elegant presentation to make it a little bit more of a Christmas tradition, something to do. So to do that, I'm taking a boning knife and I'm cutting down right next to the next rib I have. And I am just going to cut off the in-between. Now, obviously this is what you save. This is rib meat. So when you make ribs, this is what you're eating. So save that, eat it, roast it, whatever you want. And then you cut back behind it and you just start, see how it's just kind of cutting against it? And you're gonna say, well, the bone doesn't look very clean, but that is then where it comes in and you can start cleaning it. Now, again, don't feel bad asking your butcher to do this, but it's also not that hard to do at home if you forget like I did. You just take the heel then of your knife, use a boning knife, and you just scrape against them until they're clean. So I'm gonna finish up with this one, then we'll go on to the flavoring. So I got this done, washed my hands. What you can see though here is really cleaned bones. Again, it's for presentation. That's the thing at Christmas. I think we have to remember, it's a time to kind of do the extra, use the good china, do the fun things. And the thing is with meat, I don't have meat all the time, but when I do, I make sure to get good quality meat that was treated right, weight, raised well, and then I treat it right too. I think that's the important part here. So what I have over here is what we're gonna put on it, which is kind of like a quick little spice rub, nothing too intense. So I have some rosemary that I chopped up. Now, rosemary, when it comes to winter, it has a little bit of a heavier aroma to it. So we use it a lot in the winter, and I love that. I think that's really important. Have some garlic that is fresh that I have put together, and you can see I just minced it, and I'm gonna put that right in this little dish with the pepper, just, you know, ground black pepper, because these are the things. When you're having rosemary, when you're having garlic, you don't wanna fight with too many other things. They're both nice and strong. They have a lot of flavor to them. So we're gonna kind of leave them as is, as the stars of the show. Now, since I'm doing a rub on this, I wanna do just a very small amount, very small amount of brown sugar. That little bit of sweetness, what it does is, this has been sitting out, so it dried out a little bit. But since we're not wanting sweetness here, but what we are wanting is it to caramelize almost on the meat, offer a little bit more of this moisture play, which sounds weird, but what it does is it mixes with the salt and really intensifies that retention in there, which is wonderful. We're gonna add some salt, kosher salt, super important. So just like I always say, whether it's the turkey, whatever it is, salting the meat is super important. So I'm gonna mix all this together and you can see it becomes sandy. It just kind of starts to soak in some of the moistures that we're creating from the garlic. Even the rosemary has some of that essential oil and it starts coming out. So now what I wanna do is come over to the prepared, it's a beautiful center cut piece here. So we use a center cut because then it has somewhat even thickness throughout. If you get it to an end, it starts getting narrow. So make sure to always get that center cut. I'm taking my knife and I'm going straight down into the fat cap side and I am making some just small little slivers right inside of it. What this is gonna be a place for me to do is a place for me to see how I can get my finger in there 
just put some of that salt mixture and that flavoring right in. It's really hard to get flavors like rosemary into meat. Salt goes into meat. Sugar goes into meat. Flavorings like rosemary don't always. So we do things like this so the garlic and the rosemary can actually get in and get some of that flavor where we want it. So now what I'm gonna do is take this mixture and just start rubbing it on. And when I'm doing it, you're gonna see I'm gonna make sure to get it in those little divots I created. And this is just getting it in where we want it, getting it right to the meat so that flavor gets dispersed all the way throughout and rub it all over. So I flipped it over and I made sure to rub it on this side too. I didn't put the divots on this side because the others went in kind of deep and I don't wanna kind of counteract all those. So I'm getting that salt, that mixture all the way around. Now the only thing I wanna do is put some string around it. So this is just butcher's twine, butcher's rope, if you will. And what this does is it's gonna just make sure it's somewhat evenly roasts. Because the thing is, if you notice, see how when I lay it down, see how it flattens it out? And if I stand it up, it's more upright and it spreads it out. So if you put these strings kind of in between, what I'm gonna do is lay them out, put them in between each rib, what that will do is ensure that as it is roasting, you'll just have an even roast. Because see, as I cinch it together, it right away just pulls it into that nice round. And that's what you want. You want that nice round. So when you're putting these on, it's always best to loop it through once, like you always would, but then loop it through a second time and pull. What that does, it holds and allows you the chance to then just tie it into a knot. And that makes so like a butcher doesn't have to have a second person putting a finger down. You know, like when we're making gifts and we're wrapping gifts at Christmas and you're like, can you come put your finger here so I can make that bow? You don't have to do that if you do this double. It's one of those little things that makes a big difference. So I'm gonna finish this up. Then I'm gonna set this in the fridge for about two hours, one to two hours, just like I do with any meat. I want that salt, that sugar to really work into the meat. It's gonna season it better, flavor it better, super important. So this has been sitting in the fridge. It was marinating, dry rub sitting. That's really what you want. And now you can see it looks pretty much the same, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna roast it. Now we're gonna roast it, of course, on a rack. The reason we do this so it just doesn't sit in its own juice. And notice I have the fat cap, just that little bit of fat sitting up. Why? It kind of self base as that melts in the, fr in the oven. It just kind of runs over the meat and that's what you want. So air movement all the way around, it will help it actually so it roasts evenly. Now what I'm gonna do on this is a reverse roast method or reverse sear almost method, meaning sometimes like we do with steaks, I'm gonna start it lower. We're gonna do a little bit lower and slower and then at the end, we're gonna crank the heat up to really get that crackly, crispy exterior that you want. So it's gonna cook very evenly and low because pork has a tendency to what? Overcook, it gets dry, gets boring, tasteless, that's not what this is about. This is about goodness. So this roasted low and slow for quite a while. And it doesn't look that great right now. It looks kind of like blah. That's good. That means we did not overcook it. We cooked it just to 140 degrees. Then I brought it out of the oven so I could crank the oven up. And while it was sitting, that residual heat brought it up to 150. Now I have the oven set high, 500 degrees. And what I want to do is now just sear that fat and all the outside to give it some color. It doesn't take much time at all. And during that time, we're gonna make the sauce. Off camera, I just said the sauce was a dump and go. <laughs> do you know what that means? It's really no work. We dump everything together and it's good to go. It just has to cook a little bit. So we're gonna start with orange marmalade, whatever brand or store-bought, you can use home, whatever you like. We're gonna put that right in there. We're gonna add some cranberries. So cranberries have a tartness, they have a sweetness, and guess what? They have pectin to them too. And that's a beautiful thing because it thickens up with the marmalade. Little bit, don't knock it, Dijon mustard. I find Dijon mustard, I could find a way to work it into almost anything I'm making in the kitchen. And it's worth it. It has a funkiness, but it has this underlying flavor it really adds. Another spice we're gonna add, it's a weird one, a little bit of clove. Now clove works really well with the flavors going on here, with the marmalade, with that mustard, and it really does do something special. We're gonna add a little bit of orange zest, so what the orange zest will do is one, I think we all know by now, oranges, cranberries, they're a friend. And we're adding orange marmalade. So already there's a good orange punch. This is gonna add a little bit more of that freshness right away. So I do it upside down on my grater. It tra traps it all and then I can just up like that and put it right in. I love that. 
Then I'm gonna cut my orange in half just so I can add, ooh, it's a beautiful one, a little bit of that juice right in there. And that's just gonna, again, add a little bit of that flavor right there. I'm gonna throw one sprig of rosemary in. We can just stir this together here. Not that you, you can do it here. You can do it on the stove. We're gonna bring it up to a simmer. Just let it simmer for a little bit until all those cranberries burst. The meat will be done. Everything will be ready. We'll be good to go. So this literally cooked for just a few minutes just until those cranberries were beginning to burst. So you can see I like some just to stay about whole. A lot of them are just bursting and see how soft they are. So they're releasing their pectin and their kind of sweet tartness, which is what I want. It's a beautiful sauce to have with it. And then the meat came out of the oven. Now the meat had already rested outside the oven while it was preheating to the higher temperature, which meat needs to rest before you slice it. Never think you can just slice it because it redistributes the juices. It helps so they don't dry out more. Yeah. It's a, it's a big thing and it really makes a difference. So I'm pulling off just all those strings. See how evenly and beautiful it roasted? And so now, you know, the traditional presentation is right here in front of you. You can do it like that. I like to maybe show it or just have a few, you know, you can make as big of one or small of one as you want. I like to have maybe a few of them then cut. So you have kind of the presentation of the whole roast, but then going through when you look, ugh. Look at that beautifulness. Now pork always has a slight pink to it. That's very normal, pork should. You don't want to over roast your pork. It will get dry. Use the temperature gauge, you'll be happy and you'll have such a much better pork because of it. So if you slice just a couple, you're gonna see how, oh, they're just beautiful. I really, I, I, I think this is beautiful. So you can even if you don't need, if you have a bigger one, you know, you could have part of it on there, have the other two kind of laying open beside it. It's a, it's a beautiful presentation. It's a special presentation, that's the point. So I will of course try one, as one must. I do what I have to do. Now, if you're not into bones, you're gonna think, well, this is weird. You know, it's just that traditional look. It's that beautiful presentation that is kind of just iconic. And there it is all together, it's beautiful. The sauce just complements just enough. It adds just kind of a, Look how juicy that is. When you just push on it, you can just tell it's umptious and juicy. So when I just slice into it, look at that. It's just beautiful. Look at how it just falls apart. It's so tender. Get a little bit of that sauce on there. I'm excited. Mmm. Mmm. It's so tender. I think pork is underrated. Now one, I grew up in Iowa and I still live there. So that could be biased thing. More so, I think we just don't know how to cook pork properly. And a lot of times we end up way over roasting it, drying it out, not having that real flavor. So what we did here was we had a beautiful dry kind of sandy rub to put on it with that garlic and the salt and the rosemary and it really flavored it. We let it sit on there for just a little bit. You can just see how juicy it still is. And then we roasted it low and slow to make sure we just brought it up to temperature, not over roasting it, and finished it by getting a crackly, crispy skin at a higher heat. It's beautiful. It's a great presentation. You often ask what we do for Christmas Eve in my family. We make something special. This is what it's gonna be this year. We're gonna have a beautiful pork roast. And I think we're gonna really enjoy it, so I hope you do too. That's what I hope you do with these videos. I hope you're inspired to try something, create something, make something beautiful for the people you love. That's the point. Bring us together around the holidays, each and every holiday, and really enjoy it no matter what it is and who is doing it with you as long as you wanna be with them. So Merry Christmas, check my website, wiseguide.com for this recipe, all my other recipes, they're on there. And until then, eat something delicious.